Well, again, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Frederick Winsmith, and I am with NetHope. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you here to yet another uh, ICT4D webinar series that we uh, host uh, at the NetHope Solution Center. Today, we're very excited about uh, the topic, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for aid and development. We have um, representatives, uh, representatives from WE Robotics, uh, Red Cross Red Crescent uh, Climate Center, USAID, and Catholic Relief Services. And before we get started, I'm just going to go over our regular housekeeping rules. Uh, we do want to make this as um, uh, as uh, interactive as possible. So uh, please line up your questions in the chat window. Uh, please uh, I recommend everybody open the chat window and uh, watch the traffic um, of comments and questions uh, happening there. But uh, do place your questions there and we will take uh, a, a facilitated discussion, a Q&A session towards the end of the hour today. We may uh, also take a few questions uh, uh, between speakers, so we'll see what happens. Uh, we are recording this session today, so please look for a follow-up email with uh, both the recording and the uh, collateral, the presentations, uh, and we'll send a link to you there so you can review this later, or you can have, um, uh, uh, you can pass it on to uh, your colleagues and friends that may be interested in the topic. Uh, at the very end, uh, we will also uh, remind you quickly to uh, answer our webinar satisfaction poll that will show up in your browser as you end the session today. And we certainly appreciate you answering those few questions for us to help us improve this session as we, uh, uh, as we proceed. So with uh, no further ado, I want to introduce Agnen, Agnen Plavleski. He is an architect with a of ICT for D with Catholic Relief Services, and I'll turn it over to you, Agnan, for uh, to present uh, to introduce the rest of the presenters. Thank you very much, Frederick. Uh, greetings, robots, AIs, and any humans actually on the call. Um, I am Agnan Poleski, architect for ICT for D Solutions for Catholic Relief Services, and today we are exploring how AI and machine learning tools can be applied. Uh, and why they will play a key role in achieving uh, the UN sustainability, sustainable development goals. Uh, our experts uh, today include uh, speakers that will uh, discuss what new learning, uh, machine learning applications and systems are available and how they are used or can be used to reduce poverty, extend aid to remote re regions and deliver the more targeted uh, human-centric services. Uh, our speakers today include Dr. Patrick Mayer, a founder and co-founder and executive director of We Robotics, uh, Dr. Pablo Suarez, uh, associate director for research and innovation, Re uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent Climate Center, uh, and Obra Anthony, uh, senior data advisor for USA. Frederick, with that in mind, would we mind uh, switching to the next slide and uh, starting with our first speaker? Right, Patrick, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much, everyone. I'm uh, just waiting to get the share my screen and I'll be able to um, start. I didn't know you could be a founder and a co-founder of the same organization. That, that's, that's new to me. <laughs> um, I'm just a co-founder. Uh, one of four, but thank you so much, Ongen. Thank you, uh, Sonia, for the very kind invitation in the first place. Really been looking forward to this. Um, thanks, Frederick and team also for making uh, all the technology work, which is a rare thing to have happened. I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> how my team and I have been using um, uh, AI in, in the work that we do with respect to the use of robotics in, in humanitarian settings. Um, so I'll, I'll be looking at a subset of the work that I've already been doing and written about here, in, in, for example, in, in, in this book on, on digital humanitarians, which is more broad. It, that book looks into the use of AI and, and also human computing uh, to make sense of big data generated during disasters, such as social media, uh, text messaging, satellite imagery, and, and to a certain extent, aerial imagery. But what I want to do 
with the next 10, 15 minutes or so is to uh, dive more deeply into the aerial data as a source of big data and share with you some of the challenges as well as the opportunities um, that AI can, can, can bring to this space. The first question I, it's worth asking uh, to frame the, the topic is, uh, you know, where does all the time go <clears throat> when, when you're engaged in, in humanitarian drone missions? Well, if, if you haven't been involved in, in the use of this kind of emerging technology in humanitarian settings, you might be surprised to learn that the very small part of it, 5, 10% max of it, is, is really when the, the robots are in the air, when, when the drones are flying autonomously and, and collecting imagery for damage assessments or disaster risk reduction or what have you. The vast majority of the time is what I would refer to as sweating, meaning being rather stressed. Uh, before uh, the flights, uh, you have to secure permissions. You have to better understand what the areas of interest are. You've got to get your partnerships, do community engagement. There's a lot of time that needs to go into the operation before you even start flying. And, and, and the reason why I refer to this as, as sweating is, is because time is usually in short supply during disasters. You're, that's only so long that affected communities and others can, can, can hang on in the worst situations. Um, and the drone missions don't end once you start stop flying either. In, in many respects, one could say that, that drone uh, missions begin once the drones are, are back on the ground because the whole point of them is not to fly the drones. The point is to get data uh, to process, analyze, and inform uh, decision-making. And that, as you'll find out, uh, takes a ridiculous amount of time, even though we're in 2018. We find that uh, humanitarian organizations are still having to manually analyze this uh, data. So obviously, what do we want to do? Well, we want to shrink this as much as possible um, so that we can deploy more quickly, more effectively, uh, and, and obviously continue, continue to be safe in these deployments, uh, both before and, and after flights. So to give you an example and, and ground this, uh, just to share the work um, I did following Cyclone Pam, which was a, a high-end Category 5 cyclone that uh, devastated the islands of Vanuatu back in in 2015, I was asked by the World Bank to spearhead a, a humanitarian drone mission in support of the post-disaster needs assessment. Um, and the key mission here, the key responsibility we've had was to carry out these aerial surveys to help identify uh, fully destroyed houses, buildings versus uh, partially damaged and, and largely intact uh, houses. I will um, spare you all the stress that happens before uh, and did happen before these these, uh, these flights and I just skip to, you know, once the flights were actually completed. Um, aerial data already in 2015 was, was a big data challenge. We've seen from other research as well that a single 20 minute flight um, can, can, can capture some uh, 800 very high resolution images and according to analysts, this uh, amount of imagery can take about six hours or so to analyze uh, manually. And just to put that into context, we carried well over 100 flights uh, in the three weeks uh, uh, after Cyclone Pam. So you can do the math. Uh, what you'll find, as you, many of you will already know, after major disasters is that the information management teams, the GIS teams and so on, are already working flat out 18, 20 hour days, trying to make sense of the, if you'd like, the traditional data. Uh, so that becomes a huge challenge, uh, not least because uh, also humanitarian organizations, the decision makers, whether they're in the field or at headquarters, don't have the time to look through your, you know, amazing 20, 30, 40,000 high resolution aerial images, right? What they need are specific answers to their specific questions. For example, the percentage number of destroyed buildings in a given, given admin uh, boundary, right? They don't need to look at an image for that. They need a, a number. Those are the kinds of numbers that go into feeding into the post-disaster needs assessments and other damage assessments that other organizations uh, do. Now, in the, in the context of Vanuatu, uh, the, even though World Bank had commissioned this imagery, their teams, GIS teams, the government of Vanuatu was already working flat out. They, they, were, they hardly had enough, any time during the first week to have a look at any of the imagery we had collected. Uh, it took us several days um, to upload this imagery as a plan B. So literally we lost at least 72 hours just trying to upload this blasted imagery because as you all know, after major disasters and even when there are no disasters in some of the places that we work, uh, you don't necessarily have uh, regular connectivity, uh, let alone high bandwidth. So we eventually managed to get it online. So some of the volunteers from Humanitarian OpenStreetMap 
we're able to do this tracing. Red traces correspond to fully destroyed houses. The yellow is partially damaged, and the blue is, is largely intact. But but even then, they weren't able to um, to go through uh, all of the imagery either uh, at the time. Uh, what we also did that hadn't been done in previous humanitarian drone missions that I've been involved with, uh, or that I that I know of. Um, is we also collected uh, oblique imagery because the studies actually just the year before Cyclone Pan, uh, this, there were very few, this was one of the only ones, uh, suggested that getting oblique imagery, not just top-down uh, uh, vertical imagery, uh, could be actually more useful uh, for, for uh, analysis. And so we, we did capture a lot of uh, aerial imagery. These are just uh, a number of examples. Uh, we crowdsourced the analysis of the aerial imagery. We, we, that's as much as we, we could do with mixed mixed results. Uh, in, in the month or two lead after this whole operation, we worked with um, EPFL, the university in Switzerland, their computer vision, computer science department, worked, working specifically with their graduate students to see if we could actually teach, uh, use machine learning AI and so on to teach the algorithm to, to recognize uh, uh, images and or buildings in, and oblique images. And just to highlight that that's actually very, very not trivial. Uh, unlike satellite imagery and vertical imagery, uh, but, but particular satellite imagery, which is very consistent in terms of, and you know all the metadata. You know the angle, you know the time of day, you know the camera, you know everything really. Uh, it, it, it makes it far more easy to, to analyze and make sense of uh, satellite imagery using feature detection, AI, and so on. In contrast, with, with aerial imagery, you, don't, you can't assume you will have any information on the time of day uh, in terms of uh, shadows and so on, for example, you can't have you, you can't assume having any information on the angle of the camera, on the altitude. It is what data scientists, colleagues of mine, refer to as data in the wild. Aerial data is is basically as hard as it gets, given all these different variables. In any event, our colleagues at EPFL were still able to get some decent results, given um, the, the the nature of this short applied research project. But basically, are able to, with some degree of reliability identify which oblique images had uh, buildings in them and, and which didn't. And, and this is really key because it does turn out that about 30% of the images, the oblique images that we captured, uh, did not have any buildings. They were basically the bush, um, uh, agriculture, and, and so on. And you could, in a way, if you're looking for dam damage assessments, infrastructure damage assessment, you know, images without infrastructure you can consider as noise. So at least being able to automatically uh, reduce that noise and focus on just the images that have buildings that could then be analyzed by humans is a step in the right direction. Obviously, the holy grail would be to start being able to do this kind of uh, distinction between levels of infrastructure damage. And given the increasing high resolution nature of this imagery, you could envisage being able to count the number of cracks, the length of the cracks, the type of cracks, and so on, and quantify all that into a, uh, a kind of multi-risk index to quantify the overall damage of a, of a building. But, but what's very interesting, once you start getting very close, if you like, um, you find some other challenges. Um, one of my favorite is this uh, uh, comment from my very good colleague, Keiko, from the World Bank. This was just a week uh, after the cyclone, I believe, uh, in 2015, where she's saying, you know, we've got different ways of defining damage. In our case, with the PDNAs, uh, a building is uh, considered um, partially damaged and so repairable if it's 40% damaged. But, but, but what the heck does 40% damage mean, right? When you do these field-based damage assessments, you've got different people going around, and it can be very subjective. It can be based on the side of the house that you've actually had the time to look at. You're not looking at the, uh, uh, looking at the top. Uh, from, from a bird's eye view, um, and so you have a lot of quality control issues. Uh, and these quality control issues don't magically disappear because you're using aerial data, right? There's still this need for uh, assessment and interpretation of the imagery, and unless you have very clearly defined rules for what type of damage, uh, you know, you're, you're looking for and what partially damaged and fully destroyed and largely intact looks like, you're not going to make much headway. Uh, I think this was for us back in, 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 in 2015, a, a really a very uh, uh, in-our-face in kind of realization that unless humanitarians figure out their own uh, frameworks for damage assessments and update them for a world where you can get sub-meter uh, uh, spatial resolution, 
we're going to have a tough time doing consistent uh, analytics on this uh, on this data, regardless of whether you're using AI or not. Um, another area that needs to be further research, which we, we we did in 2015, but the best of my knowledge has not uh, continued, is, is also working with video, right? Uh, aerial videos, whether it's live video or, or recorded video, and doing a, a, a infrastructure damage assessments automatically. Um, uh, as this as this idea shows here from imagery from uh, videos from from Vanuatu, so it's not just static images, it's not just uh, uh, 2D orthorectified uh, mosaics, the kind of maps that you you see with aerial imagery or even 3D models, but but video as well presents another challenge for AI. Now back in 2015, when I was working for an advanced computing research institute and applying AI specifically for humanitarian uh, uh, efforts, you know. My hope was that by now, in 2018, we would have the equivalent of kind of an app store uh, where we could just basically upload our aerial imagery, run different apps based on different feature detection algorithms and, and get all the answers. And unfortunately, we're as far away from that today uh, as far as aerial imagery is concerned as we were, frankly, three years ago. That's a bit of a provocation, but, but not too much, unfortunately. Um, and so as a result of this growing frustration, frankly, uh, my team and I launched an open uh, AI challenge, right? Uh, the, the idea that, you know, we are, are in 2018 and uh, and yet we're still doing manual analysis for the most part of, of this aerial imagery. And so what we did as part, this is a series. Uh, uh, our first challenge focuses in South Pacific uh, based on some work we've done with the World Bank there on disaster risk reduction using drones uh, back in October of last year and a partnership with, with Open Aerial Map and our Pacific Flying Labs. Um, we have a number of what we call flying labs. These are local labs around the world who uh, are trained and equipped with the technology and software to use these solutions for humanitarian and, and other applications. Um, and this focus uh, for the first challenge uh, is on food security and transportation infrastructure, meaning the algorithms, the feature detection algorithms that, that we're looking to crowdsource in a way, uh, are focused on assessing food security before and after uh, major disasters. So you can find out more if you Google we Robotics Open AI Challenger, or go to this link. Um, we have some initial results that have come in, uh, just to show you some examples. Uh, in terms of food security, uh, the World Bank and others have identified different types of crops as being very important for the livelihoods of um, uh, small island states, uh, such as Tonga, which is where this aerial imagery uh, comes from. So automatically identifying coconut trees uh, before and after uh, disasters is, is really key, uh, standing uh, coconut trees. And there are many of them across these different islands, not only obviously in the South Pacific, but around the world. And being able to identify these can be a really important part of doing assessments for, for food security. Uh, just to show you here um, a, a video, uh, another team that has participated in this challenge, where the, you know they give the option of basically able to scroll around, uh, pan around uh, an aerial image, and then have an automatic analysis and classification of the types of crops, whether it's uh, coconut trees or mangoes or papaya or banana trees and, and so on. So that's just another kind of visual interface that, that's an option. Um, we were just uh, working with our Pacific Flying Labs in uh, Fiji earlier this month, doing some more capacity building and training for the use of drones for disaster risk reduction in response. This is part of a project that focused on disaster risk reduction. This is an informal settlement that you see here. And what we've been experimenting with is the use of uh, 360 uh, high resolution aerial uh, panoramics. Um, the advantage there is literally it took five minutes to take the picture, including the takeoff and landing of the drone. And it only took about 20, 30 minutes to process the 360. Unlike the 2D models and the 3D models, they can literally take several hours to process. Um, this can be an initial quick uh, data capture uh, 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 type of information product. And so what we're really keen on working with uh, other data scientists and AI experts on is, is whether we can start ap applying feature detection algorithms and developing feature detection algorithms for, for this kind of information product so that we can combine visual analysis with uh, automated analysis. So that's something to, uh, you know, uh, keep that on your, on your radar as we move uh, forward. So the, the results of challenge one, I'm just closing up now. Um, are going to be announced at our experts meeting at MIT. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a workshop specifically on humanitarian drones and, and big data uh, and uses of AI on May 15th in Boston. All, any of you are interested, please, please get in touch with me. My email is patrick at email, patrick at weberbotics.org. Uh, 
Uh, the next challenge is, some, is we're already working with will be likely in September when we launch it uh, with various partners in Tanzania, and that will focus on uh, development and coastal uh, monitoring. So we'll be showing that once we've completed this uh, first challenge. If you're interested in partnering up and teaming up on uh, this uh, series of open AI challenges, we love partnering. We are very biased towards collaboration uh, and open uh, partnerships, so please feel free to uh, to get in touch. Ultimately, what we're looking for still three years later is an open app store where folks can uh, run their uh, imagery based on different uh, feature detection algorithms in the form of, of apps, basically. Uh, that's it uh, from me. Again, my email is, is listed here. If you'd like to get involved in the work of We Robotics, we have uh, an international uh, roster of professionals from very different backgrounds who we engage with on a regular basis. And uh, a lot more on our blog. Uh, AI is a small part of, of what we do. Uh, so if you want to discover and explore more, um, our blog is a great way to do that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, you, Patrick. Patrick. Yeah. Super interesting. Go ahead, Agnan. Yes, I was just going to say really amazing stuff, especially the AI detection things, because uh, I've been working on, on some of these things, and especially uh, not just for buildings, but for agriculture, uh, being able to detect all of those different types of crop, what stage of growth they're in, the possible yields, and all these things. I'm seeing some of these already come as, as normal features in products, so it's really amazing to see um, the, the work in, in the emergency sector because most of the times uh, commercial vendors will not focus in, in that regard. So very good luck on, on the AI challenge and hope you get some really good entries because it's going to be beneficial to everyone. Um, all right, moving on with our next speaker, that will be uh, Dr. Pablo Suarez. Yes, go ahead. Well, Agnan, I was just thinking maybe we should take one or two questions. I'm, I'm afraid that we may be losing Patrick towards the end of the hour and there were two questions that came in uh, for him. So if you don't mind, uh, let's ask him those questions now. Does that work for you? For you? So the, the first question that came in was a two-part question, uh, uh, Patrick, was uh, are there some good training resources to make sure that planning and the process of collecting data with drones? And then uh, would you recommend that NGOs or humanitarian organizations actually develop this capacity themselves or should this activity be outsourced to experts? Uh, very interesting, great question. So yeah, so in terms of uh, uh, professional uh, training, applied hands-on training on the use of drones um, in, in the humanitarian context, this is something that, that we do regularly at We Robotics. In fact, we worked with Ugnan and, and Catholic Relief Services last year providing hands-on professional training to their uh, team in, in Haiti. We've also provided this training to the World Food Program, UNDP, UNICEF, um, multiple national uh, disaster management organizations uh, around uh, the world. And we also provide these trainings through our flying labs. We have about half a dozen flying labs around the world. We just completed a training this month, uh, another training this month in uh, our, our Tanzania flying labs uh, on the use of multi-rotor and fixed wing drones for uh, data collection. And so that's something that we're doing regularly uh, through our flying labs and also do through different consultancies with different organizations as well. Um, we can customize them. We have standardized modules for these. We've been doing it for a few years. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch, uh, we're more than happy. Uh, 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 you know, we do a lot of our work in the humanitarian space. Uh, we also do public health, environment, and uh, development projects. But our, our, really our core expertise is in, in the humanitarian space. So we're happy to work with NetHope and other members and, and provide this kind of uh, dedicated hands-on training that, that typically also include a, a full-day live disaster response simulation where participants really uh, apply what they've learned. And, and uh, it's another way to, to learn about some of the gaps and, and opportunities. But uh, so I would say that would be the answer to, to that part of the question in terms of uh, recommending NGOs uh, develop this capacity themselves. It's really up. I mean, that's you know the the, the, the easiest. It's really up to you. What we found over the years um, in, in working extensively with multiple humanitarian organizations, not just the ones I've, I've shared, but also, for example, the Red Cross and multiple Red Cross national societies, is that they've said very clearly to us that they don't have the time during disasters. That when disasters hit, they are in go mode. They are working 12, 18, 20 hour days. They don't have the time to collect the data. Uh, to process the data, to analyze the data. But 
as they've told us repeatedly, if that were made available to us, namely uh, a, a team, a partner to, 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 to do that, we would absolutely make use of the results. And that is in part one of the reasons, uh, not the main reason, but one of the reasons why we've established these local uh, flying labs in, in different countries. And we'll be doubling that number by the end of the year and doubling that number again uh, next year um, so that we have better global coverage where you have trained local professional teams that obviously speak the language, understand the local culture and customs, already have local partnerships and can be deployed in uh, a matter of days, if not hours, preferably. Uh, after disasters, and, and they can deal with all the issues around the use of drones and the, the permissions and the, the technology, the repairs, the maintenance, and all that. So, you know, it really is entirely up to you. Uh, we've just found that most organizations prefer not to take on those responsibilities themselves. Excellent. There was one other relatively quick uh, uh, question, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. Uh, you were talking about the algorithms of, uh, of recognizing buildings and the state of buildings and things like that. Uh, do these algorithms uh, look at plant health as well? You can do some basic NDVI um, processing on, on, on optical imagery, but what we've done in Tonga and elsewhere and uh, flying labs have done in, in the South Pacific and East Africa is, is use uh, multi-spectral sensors as opposed to just op optical cameras, and that's where you get uh, a much better indication of plant health. So, for example, our, our Pacific Flying Labs has been using uh, hyperspectral cameras as well for mangrove monitoring, and, and that kind of uh, uh, sensor will, will, will give you far more accurate uh, direct information on, uh, on plant health. And then you can, of course, if you really need to be a bit more sophisticated, do, do more of, a, of an integrated uh, risk index uh, on that. In fact, just as an aside, uh, in, in the coming months, we'll have a, a webinar presentation. We do monthly webinars as well at, at Weaver Robotics, uh, specifically on this question, uh, if, if that's of interest. Um, hopefully that answers the question for now. Great, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think in interest of time, we'll, we'll move on um, and we may come back to you with some questions in written format and maybe create a Q&A document to be posted. So, Agnan, uh, back to you. Right, thank you for that. Um, thank you very much, Patrick. Amazing presentation. Um, it's not that I, I, I get to work with you from from time to time, but um, it's really, really good stuff. Um, so next we have Dr. Pablo Suarez, Associate Director for Research and Innovation for the Red Cross uh, and uh, Red Cross Red Crescent Planning Center. Pablo, anytime you're ready, you're on mute. I don't see, oh, there we are. Can you hear me? Yes, we Perfect. can hear you loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Patrick, for setting the stage. Um, what we heard from Patrick is one of the most important and most rapidly growing areas of uh, the use of artificial intelligence, which is to look at what is and to do what the human brain will do in terms of recognizing and providing the information for decisions later. Uh, I'm going to share very briefly what some of the work that we have been doing with the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center and many partners trying to think of machine learning as part of an integrated decision-making uh, package uh, linked to financing for taking action before a disaster with the case study of flood preparedness in Togo Let's see if this works. Excellent. So West Africa, the Mono River, there's the Nangbeto hydropower dam. A dam is basically a wall with a hole designed to let water go through and spin some specialized metal, a turbine that makes electricity, which is good for development and for people and so on. When it rains much more than usual, the reservoir may fill up and water may either overspill or have to be let go for early releases with or without the dam, there would be flooding downstream. There is some capacity to operate gates and so on to regulate what amount of water goes through when, but in short, as is seen in this photo from the year 2010, flooding is pretty much inevitable in the floodplains uh, sooner or later when extreme events happen. Now, uh, 
this is a graph from the year 2010 showing from September 1st to late November how much water was in the river uh, flowing downstream of the dam in the thick line, uh, the thick blue line. And the dotted line is the official danger level. That's when official documents say that people get flooded. Uh, that happens at 750 cubic meters per second. I want to point that there's an abrupt rise of water uh, on the 22nd of September. The flood, of course, was important. Now, this shows when the actual funding to deal with this emergency was activated. It took over a month for understanding what was going on, understanding what was the need, how much money was needed for the various activities like shelter, health, and so on, and then secure uh, the mobilization of those funds. When we deal with response, the fastest response is always going to be too late. So not only do we want to make things happen faster, but also, especially in the context of hydropower, if we can see the overspill or the abrupt uh, growth in water happening before it happens, then we could take some early action. Now, let me click here. This is the usual sequencing. It's a normal day then there can be some kind of forecast, a warning indicating what may happen later. Then it may happen or not. If the extreme event happens, then there's going to be people asking for help. And then eventually help comes, and that help costs money, both in the diagnosing, as Patrick uh, showed, but also in the delivery of assistance. What we're proposing is this innovation. We're calling it forecast-based financing, where the warning triggers an early action that is based on the characteristics of the expected extreme event, the likely damage, the kinds of actions that could be taken, and how much money would be needed to take that action. If this is done before the extreme event, then there will be less amount of help requested and therefore less money needed for response. As mentioned, this is what we call forecast-based financing for early action. But that is contingent on a number of things that very often do not exist, as was the case in Togo. In particular, what if there is no early warning system? What if there isn't a reliable forecasting tool, a reliable way to communicate that forecast with the implications of what kind of action to take to relevant players, both within the Red Cross and other partners, such as government? So I'm going to share with you this image, which I love. This is a the concept is concocted by Herman Dolder, uh, who at the time was doing his doctorate research on how to make uh, hydrological models with very limited data. And he was looking into machine learning, not with big data, but with little data, little amount of data. In this case, only a few years of eight uh, rainfall stations upstream of the dam. If you have a human looking at what we know quantitatively, it's very hard to come up with an understanding. Uh, with support from the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery and other partners and a lot of work from Herman Dolder, uh, he came up with a machine learning approach, a self-learning algorithm that looks at the relationship between what has happened upstream, what has happened at the dam, and what may happen downstream. This led to our creation of a system that we're calling FUNES, which integrates information about what is happening and what is likely to happen, such as a rainfall forecast, linking that to decisions and noticing the relationship between decisions and consequences so that the next year, if we can improve things, we can improve both the collection and analysis of information, the triggers that link information with decisions and the kinds of actions to be taken to alleviate the negative consequences. So I'm going to give you a flavor of uh, how we went about this. Uh, this is uh, one of the early phases when we have a prototype of the FUNES system to link information with decisions. We shared it with the team at the Nangbeto Hydropower Dam. This is a moment that, of course, I'm very happy about, which is the, the Red Cross, Red Crescent family bringing technical knowledge, including machine learning, to dam operators who can make the decision 
of how much water to let go or not. And also, even if they don't change their decision on how to operate the dam, they can inform Red Cross, government, other disaster managers when things are likely to get difficult. Uh, with their feedback and feedback from many others, uh, we created a digital interface in French, uh, which is the official language of Togo. This is a screenshot from the first uh, day when, as you can see in the bottom uh, central area, there is a, a blue marker. This was the first time when one of the villages in the floodplain, the village of Louis Congi, had a probability of getting flooded that was more than 55% chance, which was the agreed threshold to trigger action within 72 hours of a probable flood. You can see on the top right the logos of many of our partners, the government of Togo, of course the Togo Red Cross, the German Red Cross, which uh, supported with technical and financial uh, support, uh, the company that owns the dam, uh, Communauté Électrique du Benin, as well as the Climate Center and GFDRR's program Code for Resilience. What happened was as soon as the machine learning uh, package estimated that the risk was higher than established as acceptable, it sent an automated text to people who uh, had pre-registered in the system indicating the time and location of the likely flood and the list of agreed standard operating procedures that were to be triggered based on this information. They included awareness. On the left, you see a traditional gong from Togo. This is the instrument that uh, was used uh, for generations by the local chief to inform the community of an incoming threat, whether it's a flood or someone trying to steal cows, and that was used to mobilize the community. What the Togo Red Cross did was to pre-record the messages uh, that could be played by radio stations in the local language as soon as there was information that the flooding was likely. Uh, you can also see here the radio station populated by Red Cross colleagues, very importantly, there was a contract establishing this relationship between the Red Cross and the radio station so that the, the station would suspend temporarily their normal programming, such as uh, music or uh, conversations about football or advertising, so that the Red Cross could come, the radio spots would be played, and in real time, there would be conversations between uh, the more senior people at the radio station and the Red Cross staff and volunteers mobilized at the community level where the flood preparedness uh, activities were being triggered. So who will help the lady who is a widow and has seven children to go to a safe place? What is the evacuation route? Are we going to try to save the chickens? All these decisions were pre-planned in community work and uh, the many activities included, for example, creation of shelter uh, on elevated ground, in this case next to the road, so that people had a place to go to uh, that, of course, I prefer to go to a Sheraton hotel, but this uh, rudimentary shelter is infinitely better than nothing. And uh, we have information that uh, people are more likely to go when there's a place to go to. Uh, this next photo shows the distribution of uh, items such as water purification kits, tarpaulins, water containers, things that uh, there was even distribution of plastic, sealable plastic bags for the protection of key documents like a birth certificate. And there was more uh, that happened in, uh, this was uh, almost two years ago. All these actions were taken before the actual overspill the actual um, extreme amount of water going through the dam and we should also mention that because of the improved relationship between the Red Cross uh, and the dam and other entities very especially the the government uh, national platform for DRR uh, the dam also started trying to operate the river flows as to reduce the peak of uh, floodwaters going down we are of course very happy about this it was a institutionally complex a system where machine learning provided the seed, the fundamental connector between what is observed 
what is expected to happen all within a digital platform that complemented human interaction to trigger early action, smart action. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the moment when the Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates bestows a Global Innovation Award uh, given to the project received by uh, our colleague from the Togolese government. Uh, this, of course, is excellent news. We are now in conversations about scaling up this approach in multiple locations. In this next slide, you see uh, black dots in the multiple, about, I think it's about 10,000 locations with dams, with hydropower dams. The, red, the, the green circle in uh, West Africa, in Togo, is the pilot that has already been operating. The red circles show the multiple places in Haiti, in Ecuador, in Uganda, in Zambia, in uh, Borneo, where we are having conversations with dam operators, governments, and national Red Cross or Red Crescent teams to emulate this system and uh, adapt it to their own needs. Very importantly, we are partnering, continuing our relationship with the GFDRR, uh, hosted by the World Bank, as well as the International Hydropower Association, which convenes operators and stakeholders in the uh, hydropower dam sector. And uh, for those of you going to the Understanding Risk Conference in Mexico in mid-May, we are going to co-host a a full day and a half, May 14 and 15, that will be dedicated to hydropower and risk management. If you want more information, let me know. Thank you very much. If you want to learn more, you uh, follow up via email. My email address is there, suarez at climatecenter.org. And for the technically oriented people among you, Herman Dolder developed the machine learning element. I think Herman may be one of the participants in this seminar and that is his uh, website. I'm going to end now, so we try to catch up with more uh, room for question and answer. Thank you very much. Great stuff, Pablo. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there any questions at this time for, for Pablo? Well, there's uh, a few that's uh, actually come in. One, one was specifically around the, the dam and the, uh, uh, the, some of the local circumstances there. Let me uh, read it to you. Uh, what, what is the capacity of uh, the reservoir? Uh, is it large enough that uh, granted, granted omniscience, one could completely eliminate flooding downstream? In other words, if one knew future inflow with certainty, could a policy be designed to, that, it, uh, that never has dangerous levels of water outflow? Uh, thanks for that question. The, technically, the answer is no. For any dam, there will be an amount of rainfall, of extreme rainfall, that will uh, stretch the capacity of that dam. Um, if you think of climate change, we're not talking about the, the, the flood that happens uh, one in a hundred years on average, uh, based on the past record, but maybe the one that happens one in 10,000 years. So theoretically, we don't know enough about the future it's near impossible to eliminate the risk unless you spend a lot of money on cement. But more importantly, remember that dams are created largely with the purpose of creating hydropower. So what can be done and almost always is done is to use the ability of the reservoir to absorb water in order to reduce the peak, the peak flood. It is our intuition that the, the economic forces uh, that shape decisions in this world are unlikely to completely prioritize you know, one household not getting wet in exchange for powering industry over uh, three months in, a, in an entire nation. But it is absolutely possible to collaborate between the humanitarian sector and the hydropower sector so that the combination of reduced magnitude of the peak flood, delayed timing of the peak flood, which can happen by early releases and creating capacity, combined with adequate early warnings, supported with financing to link early warning with early action, they can uh, come up with some combination of a reduction of the magnitude and early preparedness that will make sufficiently happy a majority of stakeholders. We have another question. Um, does the FUNIS algorithm use ensemble learning technique? Um, 
Herman, if you are around and you want to type your version of the answer, uh, I know that the, the technique it uses for learning is to look at the past that most suitably offers interpretations for the present. So yes, it looks at uh, an ensemble of historical data, which of course grows over time, which makes the learning better and better over time. Now, my understanding from uh, ensemble forecasting is that you may be referring to a specific definition of ensemble, so I advise you to follow up with Herman directly. Uh, I have a question myself. Um, is this all open source and anyone can replicate it, or is it? Yes, possible? indeed. The, it was one of our conditions for developing this, that this could be uh, open source and available to anyone. Indeed, in a follow-up project, uh, GFDRR supported uh, the entity that Herman works for to actually create uh, what we're referring to as a universal FUNES, which only for the part um, upstream would be the, the relevant part for this, but could be used for any system where you have data that can be used for making a prediction. Uh, that is available for free. Um, it is in prototype mode. We're going to offer, uh, assuming uh, Herman can join us in Mexico, we're going to offer a training session at the Understanding Risk event. Uh, and otherwise, you can ask for Herman uh, to share with you the link on where to download both the software, uh, which is very, very easy and simple to run. That was one of the conditions. It had to be very fast and low demands on computer power, so it could be done in rural Togo with a low uh, you know, basic computers and almost no internet. Maybe what we can do is to get some of these resources links and we could post them to the webinar uh, uh, web page as well as the follow-up uh, email. So we'll, we can work Excellent. with you on that, Pablo. Uh, I, I, I don't think we have um, uh, Patrick here still, but there was, there was a couple interesting questions around um, uh, basically uh, code of ethics and uh, there was a question earlier for Patrick and he answered, actually answered it in the chat window but it's worth repeating. So he said, could you share a bit of what you've done so far around addressing a code of ethics or establishing best practices for, for those using AI in humanitarian response? And Patrick, uh, if you're not still on, uh, I, I think you needed to drop off, but he mentioned, he, he actually left a link in the chat window uh, talking about where people can get that uh, as a document and guidance uh, on, it's it's under uavcode.org. So um, as for and some people I to may, follow up on, there was, go ahead. Yeah, if I may complement that, we are about to finalize a manuscript with Michael Veal from University College London, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public Policy Department on uh, the role of machine learning in humanitarian work, particularly on preparedness. And we do spend a lot of time talking about this question of the ethics of decision making. Are we going to delegate all decisions to a machine that may or may not understand complexity and so on? It's a very, very necessary area of work because we know, as Patrick mentioned, we don't have enough human engagement to analyze and link to decisions. So we are going to benefit from machines, but we need to understand how to deal with the consequences of decisions delegated to machines that may go wrong, at least from the perspective of some. Yeah, excellent. That was actually the follow-up question in terms of is there a UAV code type code for conduct for artificial intelligence too? And I thought that was an interesting. Right. <laughs> but Patrick, oh, sorry, um, Frederick, uh, being cognizant of the time, we do want to give our last um, panelist uh, a chance to speak, Aubra Anthony which is the Senior Data Advisor for USAID. So, Aubrey, off to you. I, I, uh, I, I planted that question. <laughs> I think it sets, it sets me up quite well for what I was hoping to talk about. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that there's interest from the rest of you as well. I Just by way of introduction, I'm Aubrey Anthony. I, I lead a small team in the um, Center for Digital Development at USAID's Global Development Lab that's focused on trying to understand the use of emerging technologies in, in our development work. Um, and so we engage in research on a variety of topics, but right now uh, the, the kind of 
project that's taken the forefront is, is really trying to understand the appropriate use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the development work that we do. Um, and so it really hits on that question of, you know, how do you tackle issues when you're, you're trying to replace humans with machines? You know, how are, the, how are the, um, the consequences of that going to be felt and how can we try and work to get out ahead of that? Um, and so, you know, especially as, as we as development actors quite often don't uh, come into this job with significant technical training. Um, you know, we're not necessarily experts on machine learning and AI to start off with. I think there's this kind of natural divide that emerges between those who are oriented in the, the space of kind of development outcomes and achieving development outcomes and, and those who really bring to bear some of the exciting tools that, that Pablo and Patrick were just walking through. And I think it's, um, you know, the role of my team is twofold, both to kind of get people excited about the potential that these technologies offer. And I think as, as everyone heard with uh, the examples that pa Pablo and Patrick just went through, I think there's a lot of really, really exciting uh, potential here. Um, but, but our team really uh, wants to make sure that we're also raising the questions that we as development actors need to be answering before we start um, relying, like I think it was Pablo who just mentioned that, you know, as we, um, automate more of these processes and kind of offset some of the work that humans have historically been doing over to machines, we need to be very careful that we're, you know, entering into that kind of activity with, with eyes wide open and really understanding what some of the, um, the harmful outcomes of that might be if we haven't gotten it right. And so the things that I mean when I, when I say, you know, if we haven't gotten it right, I think, you know, the, the webinar so far has been focusing on um, uh, certain aspects of AI for humanitarian response, but I think there are several applications that we didn't get a chance to talk through in terms of, you know, using uh, various types of data, you know, call detail records or social media, you know, text uh, data to try and predict uh, different outcomes or try to profile different individuals, you know, both for, um, you know, assessing creditworthiness of someone using uh, various data sources or trying to identify whether someone is going to be successful in an employment opportunity. And so at, at, with those types of applications, I think it's, it's maybe more immediately clear that, that there are a lot of ways that if there's bias in the data upon which these algorithms are generated or created, then that has, you know, real potential of propagating out into the way that these tools are used. So if I'm training my algorithms on data that uh, represents, you know, inequalities of today, then that's just going to, in effect, hard code those inequalities into the tools that we're, you know, increasingly going to be relying on. And so we're working to try and, and dive in a little bit more. We actually just recently kicked off some research with MIT to try uh, to start analyzing some of the trade-offs that we need to be uh, kind of frankly evaluating as we start to use these tools more and more in the development work that we do, trying to understand how if your tool is meant to optimize for, uh, you know, accur accuracy of predictions, what are some of the trade-offs that, you, that, you're, um, that you're making in terms of sacrificing uh, equity of outcomes between different populations or, um, you know, things like that. And so we're trying to, to just begin this conversation, and I think part of why we're really uh, grateful to be able to be part of this webinar, in addition to being able to learn about all the great work that, um, that all others are doing, I think it's also just to, to share that this is an area of interest and, and make sure that um, anyone else who's grappling with the same types of questions and or even just interested in uh, sharing concerns or sharing questions and trying to learn with us, I think we would love to be um, uh, part of a broader conversation there. And so I, I, you know, feel free to reach out to me directly or through the comment box, the chat box, um, whatever the the best uh, medium would be. But I think we're, we're really trying to open up this conversation so that it's not um, um, it's not something that we're just outsourcing to uh, an external audience to do the technical work and then we as development actors uh, um, operate without that kind of understanding of all of the different aspects of this, this type of technology. And so that, that's basically the extent of what I was uh, wanting to kind of bookend this conversation with. I, I tend to play the wet blanket role here, so trying to raise all of the more thorny ethical questions or, or kind of the, the ways that things can go wrong. But I, I think it's definitely not to say that others are not deep in this space. I think, as Patrick mentioned, they've done a lot of work with trying to 
um, broaden the conversation with different humanitarian actors and make sure that there are um, kind of codes that people can draw from as they try to grapple with these questions. So um, please reach out. Please feel free to email me um, and anyone on my team. I can send around emails after the fact with the, the written correspondence if that's useful. But I think that these are questions that as we increasingly use these tools, we, uh, you know, we have a, a responsibility to really ask ourselves these types of more difficult issues. Hey, Aubrey, I, I applaud your call for dialogue and discussion uh, across the various uh, stakeholders here. Uh, obviously, uh, Patrick has uh, looked at a lot of the ethics parts and, and has, uh, has an existing document that uh, we can refer to. And Pablo mentioned the fact that the same thing was underway for artificial intelligence. And Pablo, if, if there's a, a chance for you to forward uh, that material uh, when it's ready, uh, we'd be more than happy to send that out to the attendees here and also get get that posted. Um, uh, just a, a quick follow-up question to that. Earlier on, we asked, uh, somebody had asked if this capacity of doing, uh, particularly this is a question for Patrick, but maybe it's also a, a question for Pablo, uh, doing this specialized work, is it is this some capacity that NGOs and humanitarian organizations should really build internally or is it something that we should really outsource to these specialists? Uh, we, we did get Patrick's thought on this, but I'd like to hear your, your thoughts as well. Yeah, I'm happy to, to quickly share. I think this is an issue that's come up in our research time and again as we've done a, a couple of deep dives with specific uh, you know, nonprofits or startups that are trying to leverage this technology. I think you do find a sort of natural tech versus non-tech split where those who are more familiar with the um, development side might be uh, bringing that perspective to bear and those that have more formal training in the tech side are bringing that to bear and I think what we've seen where it's been successful is not that you try to create you know a team of people who are solid experts in both domains but that you really try and integrate those with expertise across the different uh, sort of fields um, so that you're not allowing that kind of natural divide to turn into a chasm and so I think what Patrick was mentioning about having the, the local team, you know, that, that can be drawn from is, is a, I think, a really natural way to set things up. I think what we need to be careful about is when that, that happens and, you know, the best practices that we've seen, and I think he's done a great job of this too with his work, is, is trying to make sure that there is, on the human side, uh, a strong sense of buy-in, and, you know, that's maybe the wrong term, but just um, an effort to try and understand uh, the use of the tool, where the tool comes from, you know, not get to the level of technical expertise where, you know, everyone is going to be able to sit down and write the code, but to be able to have the types of questions and, that lead to um, worthwhile discussions about how the outputs, how trustworthy the outputs of the code are or how, um, how appropriate it is to use the recommendations in one context versus another. I think we need to be able to develop those types of rich conversations across disciplines in order for these tools to be effectively used. Well, thank, thank you, Marsha Habra. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to be discussed here, and hopefully we scratch the surface a little bit. Uh, before we end, uh, I want to pass it on to Sonia, who has a, a couple of messages for us relative to ICT4D conference, uh, in which this uh, series of webinars is part of. So, Sonia, over to you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much, and um, thank you, um, Obra, Pablo, and Patrick, and Ognan for the um, very insightful webinar. Um, so as um, Frederick said, this is um, also um, as part of our overall ICT4D exchange, and we have the um, ICT4D conference coming up. This is already uh, the tenth conference. And it will be in Lusaka on the 8th to 10th of May for the main conference that's put together by the um, organizations you can see here on the slide. So we are a consortium of 13 organizations, a lot of expertise. There are um, 
uh, six different uh, conference tracks. One is on agriculture and environment, one on edu education and livelihood, health and nutrition, humanitarian response, digital financial inclusion, and then we have a cross-sector track on openness and collaboration in ICT. So there will also be talk about emerging technologies, um, AI, machine learning, as well as a lot of other ICT for the um, topics. So I hope um, you can make it or you can share the information with your colleagues that are um, based closer to Lusaka. Um, we have um, just uploaded our um, conference um, agenda and also an agenda for an ICT for D training day that is for just following the conference on Friday, May the 11th. And we will have different training on uh, Comcare, DHIS2, human centered design, um, building an ICT for D strategy in Zambia, and I think that's about it. So uh, there's a lot of hands on and interactive sessions. Uh, you can see more information here, and um, um, yeah, we're I think at the end of our webinar. Um, we're looking forward to um, hear and or meet you again uh, in already two weeks' time when we will talk about digital health innovations, and that uh, we will have um, speakers from uh, Catholic Relief Services, DAI Global Health, and Simprints. Uh, so we'll be uh, talks about M Health and biometrics and some other innovations and. Um, of course, ethical questions um, very much. Um, you also find some other links to, uh, again, to the conference, the training day, and we also have an ICT for the exchange on LinkedIn, so feel free to join that group um, and also share your stories and uh, case studies or um, get in touch if you like to um, be part of a webinar. So thank you so much, and thank you very much, Frederick and the NetHope team for facilitating this with us, and I'm looking forward to um, uh, our next one. Thank you very much, Sonia. Yeah, we uh, went a little over time today. Apologize for that. And I also apologize for those of you that may have experienced a little bit of technical difficulty with audio. Uh, we, did, uh, we do understand that was an issue. Uh, the recording should not be uh, affected, so if you want to go back and, and review, uh, feel free to do that once we send the links to uh, the webinar posting. I want to wish everybody a uh, great rest of your day. Please uh, take two minutes to answer the webinar satisfaction poll that will show up in your uh, browser mm -hmm. to end the session today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back in touch soon. Bye-bye.